Never. I repeat, never smile at a crocodile, okay? This is, of course, the first mistake of many that the infamous Captain Hook made in his lifetime, the worst of which, honestly, was messing with Peter Pan. This dastardly, manipulative, and pitiful character had a talented, elegant, and humorous voice actor. Let's look at who that might be. Before we start, don't forget to check out our Discord, our coffee page, and like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell, all the things. It really helps us out. Hans George Conry Jr. was born in Baltimore and raised in NYC in the year 1917. Sort of like the show The Wire. You know, if you've never seen the show The Wire. At the age of 12, he played the part of Polonius in a school production of Hamlet. And while studying at Columbia University, he performed major roles in the classics, including The Tempest. And then in 2008, he played Omar Little in The Wire. Oh, sorry. You know, I was a New Yorker, and that was the, the end of the Depression, and uh, I learned that uh, there was no more possibility of my being educated. I was 18 and a, a strapping boy, and it was time to earn my bread. And um, my parents and I emigrated to California, and uh, happily there was, uh, within a matter of two or three months, uh, I began my business that I followed ever since as an actor, and it was in radio that, much lamented from my standpoint, golden era of the, in the American theater. Sticking to the classics, he started his radio career in 1935 on a program named Streamlined Shakespeare a radio series with legendary John Barrymore. This guy Hans sure loves him some bard. We had a series of uncut Shakespeare, uh, a show, a, a station that was KFAC that called itself the Aristocrat of the Air. They had been doing just classical music, and they reached a point where they wanted to have something uh, dramatic as well as these classical uh, uh, recordings that they were playing and the news broadcast. So the only thing that the aristocrat of the air could do would be Shakespeare. Well, they had no one there who really knew much about cutting. And they, uh, there were no scripts. You just got a, we all got the same prompt books of Shakespeare. And with organ interludes between scenes, you read the play from act one, scene one, to the end of act five. <laughs> no adaptation. No adaptation at all. In 1937, he was cast in the first nighter radio program. They wanted a young character man, and I competed against 25 other gentlemen, 25 men, and I was chosen. I was the 26th, and I, I was chosen for the job. And that salary was really munificent because that was $25. Mm. Uh, radio had a good deal more glamour than anything we do now, manners for such. Uh, and I was obliged to appear in, in a tuxedo and a dinner jacket. Well, I bought my dinner jacket. I had none. And I bought it for $22.50. It was a new one, <laughs> but uh, that's what they cost and my salary, so I didn't make much profit. They must have realized that it could cost me a good deal to invest in that first production. It was these first few radio shows which honed his skills at impersonation and character work, which would come in handy for the rest of his career. Just like me. Check this out, I can do Arnold Schwarzenegger. <clears throat> it's not a tumor. Come on, I'm right here. Kill me, come on. Get to the chopper. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age! It's like he's right here with us now. When I tell you that I worked for 50 cents a night and that apprenticeship was very valuable, there were only five of us doing a show. It was a very cheap carbon copy of a very successful show out of New York called March of Time. Mm -hmm. And we called it, It Happened Today. And I remember in one 30-minute show, for which I was paid 50 cents and wasn't worth much more, I had to play 18 voices in 30 minutes. His film career started just a year after his radio work had begun. In his first movie, Dramatic School, 1938, he played a student. He started picking up bit parts in film, often uncredited, and quickly became the example to the rule that there are no small parts, only small actors. His performances, no matter how small, always stood out, with him often stealing the scene. You might say his early career was blessed as he got to work with the greats, such as James Stewart and Claudette Colbert in It's a Wonderful World, which was quickly followed by working with comedians Martha Ray, Bob Hope, and Andy Devine in Never Say Die, as well as getting the chance to work with Charles Chaplin in The Great Dictator. In 1944, Conrad enlisted in World War II. 
He trained at Fort Knox as a tank crewman until the army decided he was too tall. Huh. Must be nice. But we win in other ways, right fellow short kings? He became a heavy mortar crewman and then was sent to the Philippines as an engineer laborer until fellow actor Jack Krustian obtained his release for service with the Armed Forces Radio Network. While there, Conrad could branch out into some very topical roles. Well, comedy for me, no, I was a, a character comedian too very early, but comedy did not become, uh, come into vogue till after the Second World War. Um, I did character parts first from 35, and I did a good uh, many emotional, dramatic parts, rich and wild and fruity parts. And then when uh, the, the threat of war came and we began to do more and more propaganda shows, and they weren't always good. The acting had to be of a certain standard and not very high in order to infuriate the local market. Uh, I played, uh, uh, you know, Nazis because of my German name and the dialect, and I was the standard Hitler on the West Coast. And uh, I remember once Stefan Schnabel, if you know him, yes. he oh, met yes. me once. He said, now look, Henry, let us do as the Pope of Rome did. Let us run a line down the United States, and you play all the Germans west of the Mississippi, and I'll play them east. <laughs> After the war, Conrad continued to perform in several radio productions, such as The Great Gildersleeve, Life with Luigi, and My Friend Irma. You know, the classics. There was a part called Professor Kropotkin. He began the first show I was not in. I was in the second show on for the rest of the seven-year run. The first show, he was a musician living in, this ga in the garret of a boarding house who made answer only with his violin. But there wasn't much possibility to continue <laughs> that character, so they brought me in. And as I recall, I played it first with a Russian accent, but then the political situation. So we altered it and made it what we, a Jewish dialect, and he called himself a gypsy. And <laughs> that's the way the character developed within just two or three programs, and it held that way. And I did the same thing for seven years. There wasn't much variety. If you hear, hear one, you'll hear them all. It's only me, Professor Kropotkin. <laughs> Hello, Janie and Irma, my two little ballet dancers. One on her toes, the other still spinning. <laughs> He was also a member of the regular cast of Orson Welles' Ceiling Unlimited, for which he also wrote the December 14, 1942 episode, War Workers. With television on the horizon, radio's days were numbered, and radio stars attempted to try their hand at the new medium. Conrad was different. No, movies came to me rather differently. Suddenly television came in, and we worked for nothing. Uh, this was speculation purely, a show called pantomime quiz oh, and I yes. became a professional wise guy and it was the first time anyone had really seen me oh I'd done bits and I was working in pictures uh, from 1938 but all with small parts but suddenly when I became a professional wise guy on free television I was ushered no longer into the offices of the casting director who took care of the smaller parts I went right into director's offices then suddenly and they'd never seen me act they said well he's a funny fellow we'll use him but they had no idea whether I could fall whether I would faint under the lights or what a high point in his career came in 1953, when, in addition to receiving screen credits in eight films, one of which was the title role of The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, a surreal movie written by Dr. Seuss, he also made his Broadway debut as the sculptor Boris in Cole Porter's Can Can, where he played a struggling artist and sang two musical numbers. Too tall for tanks, but just tall enough for the big screen. He also debuted in his first and most famous Disney project in 1953, namely Peter Pan. Here's one for the symbolism in literature and theater folks. In productions of Peter Pan traditionally, the person playing Captain Hook also played the father of Wendy, John, and Michael, Mr. Darling. Thus, Conrad not only voiced both parts, but he also stood as the live-action model for rotoscoping both characters. Hans Conrad was inspired casting, you'd have to say, as Captain Hook. He was a consummate actor and had been uh, one of the busiest and best radio actors throughout the 30s and 40s. So uh, he was well schooled in how to act a part vocally. Conrad's inimitable growl and impeccable diction were perfectly suited to his roles as Captain Hook and Mr. Darling. His performance gave the characters a vicious streak, granting them both a level of pathetic impotence. It's incredibly impressive how Captain Hook, whose main antagonism revolves around anger, differs from another character, 
who allows her anger to get the better of her, namely the Queen of Hearts. Both are buffoonish and brash, but Hook is allowed a bit of pity, specifically in the codfish scene. And I mean, don't we all love a bumbling fool with a heart of stone? No? Okay. Well, I do. Blast that Peter Pan. If I could only find his hideout, I'd trap him in his lair. But where is it? Mermaid Lagoon. Now we've searched that. We've combed Cannibal Cove. Here! No, 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 that's Indian territory. But wait. He's also a bit smarter, as seen in the scene where he manipulates Tinkerbell. Uh, bringing that Wendy to the island, for instance. Dangerous business, that. Why, rumor has it that already she has come between you and Peter. But what's this? Tia? Then it is true. All of this was performed to perfection by Conrad's exceptional talent. This was not the first time Conrad had provided a voice for animation. Throughout the 1940s, he and two others shared the role of Wally Walrus in several Woody Woodpecker shorts. And in 1941, he played a taxidermist in Woody Dines Out. May I help you? Yeah, how about a menu? I beg your pardon. Conrad was very proud of his and his colleagues' work as voice actors. It was a craft. We knew did our work, and those of us, I think, we, uh, I can say honestly, we felt then, and I can speak out now and say we were very good indeed, those of us who worked. They were pretty capable actors within their scope and sphere. Between 1955 and 1971, he played a number of roles on the magical world of Disney. Among them was the slave in the mirror, Thomas Jefferson in Ben and Me, and Thimblerig in Davy Crockett. Oh, great, now the song is stuck in my head. Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. An exercise in elementary perception, ladies and gentlemen. No chicanery is involved, no natural laws are violated. See for yourselves, neither voodoo, hoodoo, nor Hindu. <laughs> <laughs> Prestidigitation, ladies and gentlemen, an old and honorable art. Now watch the little peak. And now you see it, and now you don't. Who will try his luck? <laughs> the man wins, the man loses. The fickleness of fortune, ladies and gentlemen. The hand is not necessarily quicker than the eye. Other Disney roles include The Prosecutor in the story of Anyberg, USA, the live-action model for King Stephen in Sleeping Beauty, Professor Whatley in The Shaggy D.A., and Chief Dr. Heffel in The Cat from Outer Space. Throughout the 60s and 70s, Conrad played a number of roles in Jay Ward productions, most notably Snidely Whiplash. There! <laughs> Dudley do ride to the Mounties! Get out of that if you can! And the narrator in George of the Jungle. But the two renegades had been spotted by one of George's jungle friends who flew to his treehouse post-haste. <laughs> Who is Jay Ward, you ask? Maybe wander over to our Members Only page to find out. Just one donation gets you early access. He also played the Grinch in It's Grinch Night. It's a wonderful night for Grinch Night. Their troubles will now commence. Oh, I wouldn't stay home on a night like this for $60.60. As well as Thor and Oakenshield in Rankin Bass's The Hobbit. We are met tonight in the house of our friend, this most excellent hobbit. May the hair on his toes never fall out. Hear, hear! And also, Omar Little in The Wire. How do you expect to run with the wolves come night when you spend all day spawning with the puppies? What? Wrong again. Sorry. On the live action side of things in 1957, he became a regular guest on the Jack Parr Show. Uh, very happy fortuitous occasion uh, made me again uh, extended my uh, situation as a professional wise guy and uh, from that point on uh, 
I was lucky enough to get my name above the play. That's nominally the star. I may not be a star to my fellows, but or a star <laughs> to stars. But uh, I've been in that situation, as far as my agent is concerned, now for some years because of Jack Parr. And so, in those uh, difficult times, when I was scr scratching around as a doing what I could in pictures and in television, and within a matter of two weeks or a week after he started that night show, he called me on the phone and said, look, why don't you come to New York? I've got a new show, and I need people to talk, and you have a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew me that well, and I said, what do you mean? You just talked, or what do I play? Yeah, what right. It? Well, the first time, you, uh, I had done the uh, pantomime quiz, but that was a wild... Uh, uh, superficial kind of thing in which I played a kind of a madman uh, because I only had to think fast and keep talking. But now suddenly when he introduced me by name, uh, that gave me a bit of a turn. Here's Hans Conrad. And I thought, well, now, what is this man? How do I dress him? Do I limp? Does he wear a mustache? How, what sort of a hat will he wear? And then you develop for that uh, aspect of the business, that professional wise guy, that talker, as I still do very often on shows, you develop a facade that is easy for you. I don't say it's identical with what you are by any right. means. But it is a facade. But it's, it's a facade. Well, the, the plumber has a facade. Your butcher has a facade. Every human being, there's no human being who is uh, actually what he appears to the world around him precisely. No. It's mm. something close, but not uh, identical by any means. So you develop that, and uh, that afforded me from the par show. I was suddenly found myself starring in a play on Broadway, you know. This Broadway play was in 1971, where he appeared in 70 Girls 70, and two years later, he became a replacement performer in the revival of Irene, starring Debbie Reynolds. In the late 50s, he began his rise in television, appearing on everything from The Lucy Show to The Love Boat and Fantasy Island. He'd often play a supercilious, pretentious character who seemed at times to be poking fun at himself. Get it? Poking? Hook? Get it? He also was the host of Fractured Flickers, a Jay Ward production which featured short flickers pieced together from silent film footage and from other older movies, overdubbed with newly written comic dialogue, music, and sound effects. And who is Jay Ward, you ask? Check that out here! Wait, what do you mean I can't plug it twice? Well, as long as you're here, ladies and gentlemen, this is indeed Bullwinkle J. Moose. Star of the cartoon series, The Bullwinkle Show. No, 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 Booby. You said that wrong. Wrong? You said Bullwinkle with one L. Oh, I did? It's supposed to sound like this. The Bullwinkle Show! That's with two L. That's with three L's. I put back the one you dropped. For 13 years, he played Danny Thomas's Uncle Tanoose, the Williams family patriarch. In that role, Conrad set the bar for self-parody. His comedic timing was priceless playing the lovable old curmudgeon. You know something, Kathy? You are the nicest, best-looking, skinny stick I ever seen. <laughs> Hans never stopped working. He performed right into the 80s, most notably performing Chameleon in Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends from 1981 until his death from a heart attack in 1982. Hans Conried was an impeccable gentleman and an extremely talented voice artist. Although he led a career like many from his time, following radio to animation and finally to television, he put such sheer acting talent into every performance. He really sets himself apart. And plus, he has one of the best overlooked songs in all of Disney. There isn't a boy who won't enjoy a working for Captain Hook. The world's most famous Thank you to these people for supporting us on Patreon and Coffee. And if you want to make sure this channel sticks around, you can check out our Coffee link in the description. Every bit helps. Thank you for watching this episode of Disographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it. And if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked below. We hope to see you in another discography.